are from Buffalo, Indiana. They live out on Scout Road, uh, just off of 16 at Camp Buffalo. Clay is the ranger there with brother, son, Isaac. And mom, dad, Jim, and Mary Ellen. Ruth Allen. Alice. I'm, I'm awful with names. Ruth Allen. She told me her name three times. Ruth Alice. Where are you from? From Wyoming, uh, Indiana. Wabash County. Wabash County. Anyway, Clay said, I can't do it without mom and dad. They taught me everything I know about camping. And they've been teaching me all my life. <laughs> so, with, without further ado, take it. The Watsons are going to tell us about family camping their way. Thank you. Well, I wish you had the stress seminar before we came tonight. I might <laughs> learn something. <laughs> We're not very good speakers, so bear with us. We'll, we'll muddle our way through it. Excuse me, Clay, one thing. That will help. We have a break about eight o'clock. I okay. can mention that to you, but yeah. you guys can program that in. Right. I'd like to welcome you. We're going to talk about family camping tonight. Family cam camping is really a broad topic. It's you can camp underneath the stars, or you can get a forty thousand dollar motor home and and travel and go every place of that motor home and camp in that, or you can camp in your backyard, or you can go to Alaska or Hawaii or go wherever you want to. So family camping is, is very broad and we're going to try to cover some of that today. Um, I brought along some experts with me. My dad, my dad's a retired machinist. He's a Boy Scout, Boy Scout he was a Boy Scout leader. He uh, helped with youth groups. He's camp, we did family camping for over 36 years. My mother, she was a campfire girl when she was little, and she was a girl, excuse me, a Girl Scout leader when she was little, and she helped with campfire girls. And she also family camp for 36 years. My beautiful wife, Sharon, she she's our ranger at out Camp Buffalo. She she helps out quite a bit at camp. She also teaches outdoor education classes, and she's helped with Girl Scouts and Cub Scouts. My boy Isaac, he's 14 years old. He's senior patrol leader in our local Boy Scout troop, and he's going to help us out a little bit tonight. You guys want to come on up and take your log there? <laughs> well, we're going to we're going to sit around the campfire and we're going to tell you a few stories and kind of whet your appetite and then and get you excited about family camping and then we'll we'll tell you maybe some of the do's and don'ts and and give you some tips maybe we're not there's no right or wrong in family camping you just got to get out and do it and try and enjoy it so uh, let's go ahead and get going See, I guess this is my part here. <laughs> Dad, Dad, you've um, taken our family camping for 36 years. What made you start camping with the family? Mostly as economics. I was uh, 36 when we started camping. I was a apprentice tool and die maker, learning a trade, which that meant the salary was down at the low end of the salary scale, and so. Vacation time comes around, and well, you, you don't hardly motel and uh, see the country on that kind of a salary. So we decided, well, we would uh, try camping. In the first year, we rented a fold-down camper, which was new to the camping industry there then. And uh, every time we hit a campground, well, it took us about two hours to get set up because everybody came around and wanted to see what was going on. So we decided maybe that wasn't the way to go. So we decided tent camping. And so that's, uh, we've been doing tent camping ever since. And uh, uh, we've, you, you have to enjoy it. <coughs> the first couple times out or you're going to lose it. it, it so uh, that's how we got started with uh, family camping. And uh, Ruth Alice, do you think this has influenced our family any? Uh, I think it might have uh, 
uh, influence quite a bit. Um, well, as you've already found out here, Clay is Boy Scout Ranger, but gosh, I can remember before he was even out of high school, he was attending uh, Knowles National Outdoor Leadership School out in the mountains of New Mexico and Wyoming camping, and then college degree is in forest technology, and he was out in the logging business in Washington, Oregon, before he came back to Indiana to be a Boy Scout Ranger. So something must have been influenced him along those lines. And even though our other two kids aren't in the outdoor world professionally, they do they think that they were influenced by it because um, Cindy is a teacher, and just not too long ago, um, she was doing a unit on plant life and had asked a botanist to come to her class. And after observing how she was working with her children and, and looking around her classroom, he asked her where she got <coughs> formal training in, as a naturalist. And she just had to laugh and say, well, I just grew up that way. <laughs> and um, our oldest son is, is a pastor. and. And I would like to think that being close to the nature and observing God's creation might have had an influence on him, too. So, yes, I think family camping has influenced our kids big time. Um, Sharon, you grew up in a camping family, too. So um, how has that influenced you? Well, I think it influenced everybody in our family. Um, there were five of us kids, and um, my oldest brother was um, really interested in the outdoors, and we went on a trip one time, and he talked to a forest ranger, and um, it inspired him so much that he went into forestry in college. Um, I can remember going on so many family vacations that it's hard to pick out one that's really, really my favorite, but um, I do remember a time when my dad got home from work about 5 o'clock, and we decided to go camping that night, to go on our vacation that night. And um, when we went on a vacation, we had a station wagon, and we had to pile all the equipment in the station wagon, and then all five of us kids had to get in around the equipment. So um, I remember we went uh, to Missouri, and we ended up in a... Um, St. Louis at 2 o'clock in the morning, and East St. Louis of all places to end up at 2 o'clock in the morning. No place to camp, so we just parked the station wagon in a parking lot. And the thing I can remember most about that was I had to sleep on top of the ice chest. So I wasn't very big if I fit on top of the ice chest. And um, I remember looking out the back window right before I went to sleep, and I couldn't stand the thought of somebody looking back in at me. So we had a big Tupperware bowl in the car, and I picked the Tupperware bowl up and I hold it in front of my face until I fell asleep. <laughs> and that was probably one of the um, funnest times we had on vacation as a family. We went to see friends, and we had a really good time on there. Um, Clay, what's one of your favorite camping trips with your family? Well, that's, that's a really hard question. There's so many favorites. I remember when I was about five or six, we went out west, and we went to the old west towns, and and I remember pretending like being the old westerns out shooting them up all the time. And and I remember once we went out to Gettysburg and I learned about the Civil War. And one time we all went to Washington D.C. and went to the Smith Smithsonian Institute and looked at all the great inventions around the world. And um, we, one time we went to Florida and. and um, I remember playing in the sand by the ocean, and I remember one time, we, I don't remember where it was, there's a little bug called no -seum. and we um, That was in Florida. That was in Florida, and those things ate, ate us alive. They went through the screening on the tent, and I remember all night long, we were just swatting and scratching and itching all night long, but it was a good, is a memory. Do you remember the water there? Oh, oh yeah, it tastes like sulfur, yeah, yeah it's real. Yeah, so we, we had enough change to get one bottle of pop that we should <laughs> But I think, I think my favorite memory was when um, I just graduated from college here, and we took the family, Sharon and Grace. Grace is my daughter. I didn't introduce one. 
but she's um, had a school function tonight, and she's 17 years old. But um, <coughs> when I graduated, Grace was only three years old, and me and Sharon we went up to Alaska, and we took the ferry boat up to Alaska. And what we did, we just put a backpack on, me and Sharon carried a back, backpack. I think Grace had a real small backpack she carried, too. And we bought the cheapest ferry tickets we could get to go up to Alaska. It was off season, and the, and you had to sleep on the in the seats or on the deck. And, but we took our backpacks and we got on the ferry and we slept on the floor, rolled our sleeping bags on the floor, and and we had our lunch had a big sack of food we took with us, you know, crackers and cheese and salami. And we ate all that all the way up, and then. It's just, it was just a nice, relaxing time. We was able to fellowship together all the way up, sitting on that ferry. It took about a three-day trip up there. We watched the whales and the dolphins going up there, and, and the Inland Passage just beautiful. We went to St. Petersburg, Alaska, and then we turned around and came back. And it, I think that was one of my favorite times camping we went. Brother Allison, Jim, you've taken our kids camping with you several vacations. What made you want to take your grandchildren along? Well, I guess so I can keep Grandma out of my hair. <laughs> <laughs> no, we just uh, we enjoyed having kids around and we would worked with kids all of our lives and uh, we took a couple of vacations by ourselves and uh, we just missed being around kids and so we we was out at uh, South Carolina, along the ocean there, and uh, we thought this would be a good spot to bring the kids. And so I think it was the next year we went back there and, and camped out right on the ocean and, uh, and had a great time. And uh, we was talking to the kids around Christmas time and asking them which was their favorite camping trip. And that's one that they mentioned was that first one out in uh, South Carolina. So. Well, um yeah, I, I never forget the first time that Jim and I did go camping alone after all those years of camping with the kids. And, and all I could think of was, oh, this is so easy. <laughs> because uh, we didn't have to pack all so many clothes and so many groceries and so many sleeping bags. And we could get a smaller tent finally. And so we did have a few nice vacations, just the two of us. But like, you know, like you said, Jim, it wasn't long until we were missing kids and, and thought about the grandkids and how much more fun it would be if we could share with them. And, and of course, you know, taking them to the, the beach was the was one of the best and it just was a great time of, of watching them play in the surf. And it, of course, it reminded me when the very first time we went camping, Clay was only three years old and we went to the beach and I can remember how much fun he had. And, and so it's just been a wonderful bonding time. We've never been fortunate enough to have our grandkids live in the same town, and so we can't spend quite as much time as some grandparents get to do. But when we go camping and, and do things together, put the tent up together and fix meals together and read stories together at bedtime, that's a real, brings a real closeness and a real bonding with grandkids. So. If there are any grandparents in the audience that are thinking about it, I would certainly recommend taking your grandchildren camping. Isaac, you, you and Grace have gone camping with us now quite a few times. What do you think about it and what was maybe your favorite time? Well, uh, South Carolina was, was a lot of fun. We, uh, the ocean, I just love the ocean. We played on it beach all the time and uh, most of the time. Uh, I remember one time we went up to Wisconsin and it, it was uh, just rained and rained and rained on us. And <laughs> it took us forever to get dried out and then we just rained again. And, and But we got through it and we still had a lot of fun. Well, Mom and Dad, you guys just came back from Florida a few days ago. Don't you think you're getting too old to go camping? Well, last week, the other morning, I thought that I was. <laughs> but uh, getting up off the ground and uh, trying to get up and get dressed 
And the temperature was cold. If anybody had been watching the temperature last week in Florida, they had cold snap. And where we was camping, it was uh, 35 degrees. So it, it kind of got a little uh, chilly down there. But uh, we still had a good time. Man. Once you get up and get moving around, you get all the all the bends and things that uh, <laughs> creaks and crannies moving away, warmed up here. So it, uh, we, we still I don't know how many more years we'll go at it, but uh, we're still doing it. Well, you see who got stolen by everybody else. <laughs> got a lot, but yeah, um, I guess uh, the old bones are getting <laughs> kind of achy to sleep out in that cold weather, but um, or even in the warm weather, and the real trick is just getting out of the tent every morning. But, <laughs> I just think we'll be doing it a while longer because we love it and um, I don't know, I guess I feel like that um, we've always traveled along with our camping or at least most times we have and, and I think when you camp and when you have to go the back roads to find your campground and, and you're out there and in the out of doors, you really get in touch with with the nature around you and the area around you and you really see it like it really is. And I think I would miss that as, as you know, if we continue traveling and, and maybe go the motel route. I think I might feel a little cheated and feel like I'm missing something if I'm not out there in the tent and, and uh, really being in touch. And, and um, I guess the call of the wild still is there. <laughs> Well, sure, and Clay, uh, I can't feature you living on a boy scout camp and then come vacation time taking a camping vacation. I mean, aren't you camping 12 months a year? <laughs> well, I think still one reason that we probably, um, the biggest reason probably is that it still is um, the cost. Um, I think that we've been able to afford to stay longer on a vacation and to do more things while we're on vacation um, because we have camp. Instead of spending the money on hotel bills, um, for instance, uh, a few years ago we went to Florida and um, we were able to go deep sea fishing and uh, snorkeling in the Keys and those are things that we would have probably missed because they are high items to pay for when you go on a vacation. And um, with paying for four of us, I, we probably wouldn't have done that if we had to stay in a hotel. So I think part of it still is the cost. But then there's another part too that um, it just is a good time to be near your family. Um, when you're camping, you have you get to know each person in your family a little bit better than you probably would in any other situation that you're in. Um, you uh, are able to just um, build memories and a tighter bond between the members of your family when you get to be in the outdoors and have to actually work together to get something done. Well, I think I we just enjoy it so much. We we watch people come out camp all the time and camp and. They enjoy it. We have we have some family camps out at camp with the younger in the Cub Scout programs, and they come out and they enjoy it. And we we try to share and help them out a little bit, and and we kind of chuckle at them a little bit. And I, and I'm sure we got chuckled at too when we first started camping. But it, it's it's one reason we just in, just enjoy it. we we enjoy being out there in God's creation sitting at night listen to the whipper wheels or or um, watch the coon get in the neighbor's um, ice box or um, or just it's, it's just fun to watch different things that nature does pull, pranks pull on you <clears throat> um, like Sharon said it's quality time with the kids you, you really we've um, a lot of times Sharon will We'll be sitting in, laying in bed, and we'll have a flashlight, and Sharon will read the story, a story to us. I remember when I was little, we used to lay in bed, and we used to hear about the family history, about our family tree, you know, where my great grandparents, and, and just, you know, I don't remember none of it, but it was fun to listen to it. <laughs> um, it's a good time to teach the kids responsibility, and, and um, 
and teach them new skills. They teach them how to set up the tent or teach them how to cook on the fire and, and um, they really enjoy that adventure and they, they need help doing it. You share it, share with, help them do it. You can teach them good values and, and um, good values in life and just, it, it's just good quality time again. And, and one of the biggest things is building memories. You'll, you'll remember things the rest of your life. It, it might be <coughs> that night, you might think it's the worst Worst night you ever have in a big windstorm or rainstorm, the tent's Rain flapping you. <laughs> you think you're going to fly away with the tent. And you, or those mosquitoes or no sins. But there's some awful good memories too that you remember and, and you'll, you'll remember the rest of your life. Well, does anyone else have any more stories they want to share? Well, I, I don't know. I guess Clay doesn't remember too much when we went. When, usually we've always had the tent and had, you know, a certain amount of modern facilities. But one year, when I guess Clay must have been eight and then Cindy was ten and Chuck was twelve, we went um, backpacking and we went out on the Appalachian Trail. Uh, started in um, Pennsylvania. And that was the same year that we went to Gettysburg, I guess. And. Um, so we all had our backpacks and we just were going to sleep under the stars. And we were out for about three days and three nights, I guess, and, and hiked on the Appalachian Trail. And I remember Cindy crying most of the time. And <laughs> she, Dad, just, she, he, every time she'd get upset, then he'd take something else out of her pack and put it in his pack. <laughs> and, um, but we did some, felt like pretty serious climbing that year, and I, I felt like crying a lot of times, too. <laughs> but I think it was, I, I think Clay was almost too young to remember, but I, I have a lot of good memories, and probably the other kids do, too. And, uh, they, we probably saw more wildlife that year than we ever did. And, um, it was a really neat time. I remember we had to take dehydrated food, of course, because it was a lot lighter to carry, and, and um, we had just enough water to fix breakfast to make the food from powder to food, and, and then we spilt the water, and so we didn't have breakfast one morning. <laughs> Those are the kind of things, though, that, that you always sort of remember. Um, I don't know. But I remember that night that it rained all night, Isaac, and it, I think we ended up, it got so bad that was lightning and thundering and we ended up in the car the rest of the night and, and Grace didn't give you very much room in the back seat either, did she? <laughs> <laughs> but those are the things we talk about when we get together, so it sure does build a lot of good memories. That, that's one thing about tent camping. You, you'll probably end up spending a few nights in the car because of real bad rainstorms or thunderstorms or windstorms. I know the last trip when, when we took, went to Florida, we uh, we was over on the ocean side, and, and um, it came a real heavy gale wind that night, and we just had a little dome tent, and the tent was just blowing back and forth, back and forth, and oh, we swore we was going to get blown away that night, and and so probably about one or two o'clock that night, we packed up all of our gear, and and the kids and. And Sharon started sleeping in the car. And I just got out, walked around, and there was a fishing pier there. And I sat and watched them fish all night long. They caught a big old shark, and watched them dress that out. It was really interesting. You learn a lot, you know, about the, the natural, the different cultures in the area. You have to realize that when our family goes camping, we go camping in a Ford Tempo, four of us, <laughs> and our daughter is as tall as this one, so it's getting a little tough these days. <laughs> but we still have a good time. Dad, you got any more stories you want to share? I think that uh, there's a lot of time, we've talked about rainstorms and everything like that. And uh, one thing, if, when you, if you go camping, kind of look at the weather channel around there to see what's coming up. It kind of gives you an idea how to go. But we was out in Kansas one on one vacation and it came up a big rainstorm and windstorm out there and the tent that we had at that time had a center pole in it that uh, held the 
top of it, and uh, the grommet on top broke loose, and the tank came down on top of all of us right in the middle of the night. And so there I was laying, and everybody was laying like this, holding the top of the tent up, and uh, I was trying to think, now how in the world can I get out and fix that thing? And finally I did. I come up with the solution of getting out and getting a tin cup out of the camp kitchen and putting on top of the pole. So it, we worked ourselves out of it. So it, uh, sometimes you have to be creative when you're out camping. It teaches, it teaches you problem solving, right? <laughs> yeah, problem solving. And, uh, lessons for kids. Then you come back and take stress management courses. <laughs> <laughs> See the Watsons are sold on family camping. Yeah. 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 Thumbs up. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll get in a little bit of the technical area of it. And yeah, you guys might want to swim. Yeah. There we go. things to remember about camping. And I'm sure there's more on there that you should remember about, but we just listed five of them. The first thing, camping is fun. That, that's the most important thing. Go with a positive attitude. You know, th this is a good time to, to relieve some of your stress. Don't take your worries from, from home or from work with you. Leave that home. Just, just um, have a good time with your family. Okay, camping can be enjoyed by all ages. Well, I started camping when I was three years old. And my parents are in their mid-60s. They'll probably keep on camping until at least 70s or so. So you, there's a wide range there. You can keep camping all ages. One of the main things about um, the different ages, though, especially when you're doing it with your family, make sure you do everything for each age group of your family. You know, if you have some real little hikes, make sure you go on the swing sets and, and, and take special time out and play with them and, and enjoy them. And then, and then you can take time and do things for you, you know. The, the kids, they, they get bored by going through museums if you spend all day long in there. I remember my mother, she's very slow and meticulous. And, and she goes to, through a museum, she, she reads everything on that wall, it seems like. <laughs> And boy, I was always tugging on her tail. Let's go, mom. Let's go. <laughs> but but we 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 enjoyed it. Um, camping is a good time to learn new skills. This this can be just learning how to set up a tent can sometimes be a big skill to learn. Tents are pretty simple now. They they don't take long to set up. But but it is still. And it's a good time to teach your children how to set it up. To say, well, you pull in the campsite and say, okay, kids, go set up the tent. And you guys can go off for a walk while the kids set up the tent. And, and come back and they'll have it done. It's great. Sometimes sometimes it might be wrong. You might have to change it around. Other skills is, is teaching how to cook on the fire. It can be, you could even try to make a pineapple upside down cake on the fire. It's, there's all kinds of new skills you can learn. Some, Sometimes you have to be a MacGyver and, and try to engineer things. You might have forgot to leave something at home, so you got to engineer it to make it work through the rest, rest of your trip. Camping can help your family learn to share responsibilities and work together as a team. That's real important. We've, we've, um, we've stressed that a lot with our kids, trying to get our kids to work together. You know how, how you go on long trips and the kids are in the back seat fighting and beaten, especially when you start going through a city or something like that, you might be driving through the prairie for a long time, no traffic at all, and they're back there sleeping, but when you hit the city, they'll start fighting and carrying on, you, you go crazy. But this is a good time to teach them how to work as a team. Have them, like I said, have them set up the tent together, have them learn to cook together, do the dishes together, it's a good time to, to teach them how to do that. And, and work as a family unit. unit. <clears throat> and again, 
camping build memories. It's just like we were sitting up here talking. We've had all kinds of memories we've, we've been um, sharing with you. And, and these memories will, will live with the rest of our life. And some of them are good memories. Some of them are bad memories. But, but they're memories. And, and, and it's, you, you go at home and you watch TV. And next morning you wonder what you watched on TV. But when you go out camping, you'll remember what happened that weekend. I'm sure you will. Okay, that's all I got. <coughs> You really want to be planning your trips and everything, and uh, without planning, things just don't happen. So, these may be, you may want to reverse these two. I was looking at this a while ago. And, uh, where do you want to go, and how long is your vacation? Maybe you want to say, well, how long is your vacation determines how long you can go. Uh, Allow yourself ample time. Uh, traveling sometimes uh, can get uh, tedious. Uh, you may run into difficulties, so don't try to go to the West Coast all in one day. Um, allow four or five or six days so that it can be relaxing. Uh, also, you can take in some side trips. Uh, you can look at a map and it and they always tell you what's out there. Uh, some of our best experiences has been when I got lost going somewhere. Due to my navigator, she wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's a fun time to explore and find things. So, uh, <coughs> figure out where you're going to go and kind of come up with a time schedule. Uh, but don't let that be written in stone. Be, be able to be flexible with it because you may get somewhere and uh, it's just your ideal spot and you only plan to stay overnight there. And, hey, what, wh why do we have to leave? You know, so be flexible on your time. And travel at an easy pace that's what vacations is. It's, it's not a go as fast as you can, get there, and turn around and come back home all tired out so that you go back to work to get rested up from your vacation. It's, it's supposed to be relaxing. So, what will make it special? When you're planning a vacation or camping trip, take uh, Clay kind of hit on this a little while ago, do things for the whole family. Make it interesting for the families. Uh, uh, plan it for, if you're going to a historic site, uh, try to fill it in with the kids' school, what they're learning in school. I know we, we tried to, well, we went to Washington, D.C., we've been to Gettysburg, we've been to uh, Monticello. Uh, Monticello. Uh, just things like this that uh, brings out history to the kids in school. And I'm sure that uh, when they learned about or was taught to us in school, they go, well, hey, I've been there. I knew about Jefferson. So make it interesting for them, too. Uh, the style of camping. Well, you can have a tent like this, or you can just have a tarp and a couple of poles. Or you can have a $80,000 motor home. It really, camping, it, the word camping doesn't mean that it has to be one certain way. Uh, we've camped beside uh, the big buses where, I don't know, they look like they're about 80 foot long. I know, no, they're not, with the TV antennas and the air conditioner and everything like that. And we've camped right beside them with this tent. Uh, so. Whatever you want, it's the style of camping you want. Uh, if you want, uh, if you like modern camping, maybe a trailer, RV, and go to a modern campgrounds. It has hookups, has your uh, sanitary hookups, your water and everything. You don't have to leave your campsite to get your water or 
go to the bathroom or anything like that. Or you can go uh, to a wilderness camp where that you may have to go for about a mile down the way to get water. You may have to use a pit toilet. So it, there's, there's something out there for everybody. And uh, some of our best times has been off the beaten paths. We went out to the Rockies once and uh, trying to get into the Rocky Mountain National State Park or National Park in the summertime is like uh, trying to fly to the moon almost because they're always booked up. Uh, it's hard to get in. There's a long waiting list. But there was happened to be a national forest about you know, maybe 25 miles from there. But there and most of the time we was the only ones there and we just had a great time. We had all the, there was a pump there and there was a the pit toilets and everything and uh, picnic tables. So it's up to you what style of camping you want, but uh, just seek it out. And uh, there's so many things that you can do. How long do you want to go? How long do you want to drive each day? Give yourself ample time. Uh, if you're traveling and going from one destination to the other and you got maybe three or four stops to get there. Remember it takes time to take down the tent, pack the car, and go. So don't plan on trying to make five or six hundred miles that day because when you get into the next campground, your wife wants it to be light so she can cook supper and, and we can set up the tent so that we don't have to use flashlights and stumbling around and everything. So give yourself plenty of time going from one destination to the other. Uh, what kind of help do you, do you need? Well, there's all kind of help out there for uh, travel, uh, for camping. There's, uh, oh, there's uh, AAA. You can get uh, campground directories out of that. Uh, Rand McNally puts out campground, you know. Campground directories. Uh, uh, if you need uh, to ask somebody that has experience uh, where you're going, you know somebody that's been there. Well, ask them for suggestions. <coughs> where to go, what to do, uh, when's the best time to go in there, or things like that. So seek out your help before you, before you start out. And what activities do you plan to do? And this is, uh, determines what kind of camping you want to do. Now, if you want hiking, you've got to plan ahead for that because if you want a pair, good pair of shoes and stuff like this for hiking, if you're backpacking, you want to make sure you have a good backpack. Uh, if you're going uh, to the oceans or to the golfs to, for swimming, Sure, take uh, sun tan lotion or sun uh, screen, your swimming suits, uh, or maybe it's just going to be a sightseeing uh, trip. Uh, one year we camped just right outside of Washington, D.C., so that we could uh, tour Washington, D.C. This was many years ago, and there, there was an old army base that was in Washington, D.C., and that's where we stayed. We, we was within almost walking distance of Jefferson's Monument. And uh, so seek these things out. And you can find all this in your campground directories. Uh, if you want a history uh, camping trip, uh, say Gettysburg or uh, some of the other Civil War or Revolutionary War uh, places to find, or out west you see the uh, well, gold, they found a gold out Sutter's Mill out in California, you know. There's all kind of historic spots around the country. We stopped at Dodge City once. Uh, everybody knows of Dodge City, Kansas. And, and uh, so seek out these things. Also, it, uh, you may want to make it a boating camping trip. There's a lot of people that uh, has a boat to uh, travel and just beach it at night and a lot of places on uh, these big reservoirs and big lakes they have campgrounds strictly for boats uh, or uh, so you can pull in there you don't uh, 
have to motor or take a car to it and everything. And uh, then also, like I mentioned, backpacking. So there's many things you can do. Uh, it's up to you. The sky's the limit. And uh, is there any questions? I'll open it. <laughs> Might insert in there too is camping with other families. That's right. something we've done a lot of times, and that opens up a whole new problem. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we had uh, some real good friends that, uh, well, we camped with them quite a few times, and then they moved out east. And uh, in order to visit them, well, we met halfway, and uh, we'd meet, and uh, their family and our family both. The kids were about the same age and everything, and, uh, and so uh, they enjoyed it, we enjoyed it, we got to see each other, and so uh, there is, also there's uh, church group camping at uh, our uh, youth groups or YMCA, there's all types of different campings, but basically it boils down to the same thing, uh, be prepared, uh, planning, Watch the weather channel before you go. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll just go ahead and take the break right now if that's all right. Okay, we can. Yeah. <laughs> Overnight. They have uh, they have campsites on the, all, all along the trail. Uh, a lot of them are positioned. Uh, oh gosh, they vary in lengths from well oh, maybe uh, ten miles to twenty miles, and they have. Uh, Adirondack shelters at a lot of them. These are three-sided shelters with a platform in them that you can sleep in there. We took a tarp along and uh, with the th three kids being as young as they were, we didn't try for distance. We were just out for quality time. So we knew we wasn't going to hit the primary campsite. So we just took a tarp along and uh, oh, I think we slept at a uh, I don't know, an old church or something. Kind of a lookout. Yeah, yeah, we went around the lookout, around a lookout tower, tower there. once, and so. It was just kind of a clearing. Uh, yeah, so uh, there is camping all along the road. So. Cates Cove is a, a good place to do backpacking camping. It's only 10 hours away. And Cates Cove in, uh, <laughs> in the Smoky Mountain, Mountain National Forest That's Park. National Forest, yeah. Near um, Gatlinburg. <laughs> They've got they got several trails and they've got Adirondack shelters all around. It. And they've got real short hikes between each of the campsites. It's a real real nice place to do on What is over at Buffalo as far as it's camping? At Camp Buffalo, yeah. it's a Boy Scout camp. We do mostly tent camping. We have some cabins that the during the winter some of the troops stay in to stay in. Um, we we offer a five week summer camp. For the boys, we have um, Cub Scout programs, and and um, we start all the way down to the first graders in the Tiger Cup program, and we go all, all the way up to the Boy Scout program, up to 18 years old. Do you have that camping? Yeah, some we do have some family camping in the Cub program. We we did offer some in the Boy Scout program, and it's never really took off. But in the Cubs program, it it's pretty it's pretty good. It's, it's, they're pretty interested in that at that age. But it is a Boy Scout camp. Right. It is for Boy Scout families. Yeah, we, we don't we don't open it up to the public. We do have some church groups in and stuff like that, but no, we don't open it up to the public. I might mention that uh, there's a lot of uh, private campgrounds around too, like KOAs and stuff like this, and uh, you can seek those out. To, uh, there's state forests you can camp in, national forests, uh, uh, state parks, national parks. So there's camping just anywhere you want to go. Really. Yeah, no this way. man has given you so many pearls. I, I had screwed up everything you've said today <laughs> at least three times. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah, right. The biggest temptation is we're going to get to West Virginia, and so you get in at 7 o'clock at night, yeah. and the sun's gone down, and you got to put your tent up in the dark, and then cook your supper and get to bed. The kids are crying, mm -hmm. and they want their supper, and hell, you can't even find the pans. <laughs> well, I had to learn that myself, too. <laughs> yeah. It's a painful lesson. And pretty soon you say it's 4 o'clock. Where are we going? Stop. Yeah. Somewhere. <laughs> yeah. You learn that. That's right.
And uh, the one thing we always enjoyed is uh, seeking out campgrounds that are not down along Interstate 65. <laughs> get back, get back away from that, and you'll but find. You know, there, there's something to be said for KOAs, easy yeah. access, That's because it. you're trying to get somewhere. If place. you're trying to get somewhere. If you if you got a camp, there's, there's a whole number of campgrounds that are rapid access. Get in, spend the night, get up, and get out. Mm -hmm. If that's what you're trying to do, yeah, KOAs, KOAs are Vermont Camp Inns, Pure State or Vermont Camp Inn? No, no, not too many of them. But Vermont had this great idea not too long ago. They built a hotel room in the middle of nothing, and then you put your tents around it. Oh. And you could go into the lobby, and there was a lobby, but that's the only room they had. <laughs> well, KOA has lodges too. Low, uh, lodges they, you can have, so you don't don't even have to pitch a tent. You just have kind of a little lodge. Uh, the probably the most underused camp facilities in the country are run by the U.S. Public Health Service. Or, uh, Forest, uh, Forest Service. Forest Service. You mentioned that. I lived for two years in South Dakota, and. Uh, Sure, we had Custer Park and the national parks, but there were 500 national camping reserves, and most people didn't even know they existed. And they were wonderful. And you could write and get a map. The U.S. Health Service, for, I keep Health Service, Forest, Forest Service. And it was the Bureau of Land Management, BLM land. Yeah. That's another, that's mostly in um, Texas and Arizona. Some of those places you can camp for free. They, yeah. the, we have some neighbors that do that. They call it boondocking. They go out and they got a their big motor home. They're, they're up in their 60s. They're retired. They got their big motor home. They pull out and they'll stay a week or two. And they got a solar powered um, cell up there. We'll run for vacuum cleaners to sweep out. <laughs> you know, run the TV. You know, for a few hours during the day. And and about once a week they'll load up and go into a dump station and get fresh water and, and dump there. Can water. you still get a Golden Eagle permit? They still have those? I think so. You all know about Golden Eagle permits? It's a permit you buy from the United States government. It's a Golden Eagle and it goes on your car or someplace where you want to stick it. They also have cards too. Yeah. And that lets you, you pay what, 25 bucks or something like I that? I what the fee is now. I'm and that means you can stay at any pay. federal camping <laughs> facility for a year. If you're over 65, they got yeah. <laughs> right. The senior goal of the they're five dollars off. But for twenty five bucks you can stay for a year and go camping. Mm -hmm. At any federal here. facility. Mm -hmm. And that's neat. Yeah. Uh, are you familiar with the facilities over Tipkin County State Park? Yes. What do they, they have, have over there? They, they have uh, mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> this is a really good place for beginners to go camping. They have what it, they call a rent a tent program. Mm -hmm. You can go over there. They you rent a tent. It's already set up for you. They got a camp box for you. For the you you get the cook pans and a stove and lantern. And I think it's real reasonable price. And you can spend the week there or a weekend there, whatever you want, uh, overnight. There's a lot, a lot of things to do over there. We go over there as a family. We, we ride our bikes over there and, and um, hike around. There's a lot of horseback riding. Um, you can rent bicycles over there. They've got a fire tower over there. It's an excellent place for a family to go. They also have a youth tent area. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah, youth group, yeah. And the tents are on platforms, so they're not you're not sleeping on the ground. The rent a tent. For somebody that's going camping for the first time and uh, seek out something like this or because uh, you gotta try it before you know whether you like it or not. The state parks are excellent. Right. In Indiana yeah. Yeah. and in Ohio the state parks are just excellent. Mm -hmm. If you've not been, if you've not been to the dunes, my goodness, mm -hmm. Indiana Dunes is a wonderful program. Just across the state line, Michigan Warren Dunes is a wonderful. If you like dunes and night camping, oh, reservoirs are excellent around here. Salmoni, Central Wall, Huntington—they all got camping. 
They're very well maintained. A lot of them will take reservations now, too. So yeah, call ahead them. on weekends because yeah. don't just think you can walk in because you can. But a lot of people got this bug and uh, they fill up quick. You can well, call the Department of Natural Resources in Indianapolis and they'll see you all that information. Yeah, we're going to get into a little more of that here later on. So, Well, let's take our break and get a cup of coffee and we'll continue here a little bit. Uh, family camping. As uh, Dr. Kenny said, the, the real high adventure. And the most dangerous kind of camping. While we're waiting on the rest of them to get back in there, I'd like to see the hands of people that have done family camping. Yeah, that's what I thought. I don't know why we're here. You know? <laughs> no, we know all the stuff you do wrong. Oh, yeah. Well, well, we found out the hard way, too. <laughs> we went through the school of hard knocks many times. So I'm glad to see everybody. In the, so I, I just hope that we have a little insight for you. Soon, right? I want to make a commercial plug, too. We've got a guy that owns a campground. What, 10 miles west? How many miles west of Mono? It's, it's uh, right. It's 10 miles from Rensselaer. 10 miles from Rensselaer. What's the name of it? Little Creek Campground. Little Creek Campground. I've never been there, but I'm sure it's a great place. Come visit. Come visit. Okay, we're going to talk about gear and housing a little bit. Okay, we talked about sleeping underneath the stars. This is great. We, we used to try to do this once a year. It's fun to do during the summer. We usually end up getting wet from the dew. But we'll go out in our backyard. We've got a big backyard. We've got 265 acres of camp. <laughs> but we got a big activity field. We'll go out there and lay underneath the stars at night and just watch the falling stars. We usually try to pick when they're having a lot of meteor showers. Or sometimes you can see the, the um, aurora borealis, the, the um, northern, lights. northern lights, you know. And, and it's just fun laying out underneath the stars, listening, and, and just enjoying nature. I did, I did a lot of this um, out west. is a good place to do. I um, went to Philmont, um, Scott Ranch out west, and also to Wyoming. There's very little dew at night, and so it's a lot drier climate, so you can sleep out, and, you, and your bags, don't, your sleeping bags don't get wet. A tip about sleeping underneath the stars: you usually get eat, eat up by mosquitoes. Just when you go, take a a real thin sheet and and just put it over your head, your over your body, and they the mosquitoes don't bother you that much. You don't hear the buzzing. <laughs> <laughs> and it works real well. Uh, next type of housing is a tarp. When I go backpacking, you know, I like to take a tarp. This is my tent. This is my shelter. I got some stakes in this side pocket and some rope. And I'll just find a, two trees and tie a line across that and drape that over and, and put some stakes in. I just have a lean-to. It's open in on both sides. And uh, it's a real lightweight shelter. And, and uh, it's a real easy way to backpack. We did that a few times with family, several times with family. We do it all the time with the Boy Scouts, with the Scouts when we go camping. Tents. Um, that's a big, wide range. You can you can buy the $29 tents that will last you about two trips. Or you can buy a real nice tent. Mom and Dad's got a nice Eureka that's 20 years old. That tent there is 20 years old and it will probably last another 10 or 20. It's, um, they, our scout troop bought a, um, some Eureka tents and it's basically the same style but there's the, pools, the pole just a little bit different configurations. That tent also has a fly on it that sticks out so when it rains it gets the water out, out away from it. Um, if you're just beginning camping, good to just go ahead and buy a cheap tent. See if you like <coughs> camping. Or, or the best thing is go to Winamac or someplace where they have the rent a tent program and go rent a tent and sleep out underneath the tent. See if you like it. See if you can stand those mosquitoes flying around you. Or, or think about the creepy crawlies on you. Clay, at Tippecanoe, can you just go in at that main entrance and tell them you want to rent a tent? Yeah. Probably best to call them in reserve. I, I've been there and several, they seem like they've been pretty well booked up. 
on on the major um, major holiday seasons. You know, maybe later in the fall or early in the spring, you might get them without reserve. Like a weekday night, you could rent a tent. I'm sure you could on a weekday. Yeah, yeah. And that and that's a that's a great way to start out. If you don't want to do that, like I said, buy the twenty-nine dollar tent and 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 uh, set it up in your backyard and try it that way, or buy a tent like that. Those tents now are probably one hundred and seventy dollars right now. You can get a, you can get tents up to four or five hundred dollars. The bigger ones. There's a place at Wabash now that is. Um the ones that are taken back in stores and stuff, there's like seconds that you can get them like that too. And I think our first tent was a second that we found out about. So if you shop around, you can find a bargain if you don't want to invest big right at first. If you think you're going to do it for a while, go ahead and buy the quality, the name brands. Eureka's a real, real good name brand. Um, Boy Scouts, they offer... Um, Plug and Boy Scouts, but they offer real good quality tents. <clears throat> Something about tents, you need, we didn't put one underneath this tent here, but you need to put a ground cloth underneath <coughs> of it. it. When you sleep, it pulls up moisture up underneath the, the ground has moisture and it pulls it up and gets into your sleep, into your tent and, and gets into your sleeping bag. Um, so it's best to put a layer of plastic but a lot of people, what they do with that layer of plastic, they'll, they'll leave it sticking out over the edge, you know? And, or else they'll, they'll lip it up and put a clothespin on it. Well, when it rains, that thing's just going, the water's just going to go right underneath your tent. So make sure your plastic's about two inches shorter than your tent, okay? So that way when it rains, it doesn't get in that plastic and goes right in your tent. It'll stay a lot drier that way. That's a good thing to do when you're sleeping with a tarp and also sleeping underneath the stars is, is to have something underneath you, a barrier. A lot of people have foam pads. I don't think we brought any foam pads. I know mom and dad are using, we first started out with air mattresses. Everybody remember the air mattresses? You jump on them about middle of the night, they usually go flat. Mm. So I, mm. I never did like them. And, and um, they're coming out with foam pads. Foam pads are real nice. You can buy real expensive pads up to a hundred dollars that you roll out they inflate their cells and you roll them back up and they deflate and, but it depends how how good a sleeper you are if you work real hard or do a lot of hiking it don't take much to put you to sleep okay campers um, campers is like on back of pickups um, they used to be real popular you don't see as many as them many of them as you do now Kind of the disadvantage of a camper is um, first thing you have to have a pickup. Next thing, if when you pull into the site, your your home's there and you forgot to get a quart of milk. Well, you got to pack everything up and and go get your quart of milk and then come back and unpack again. So campers, they're they're nice and don't get me wrong. I used to have a camper and I. When I lived, when I um, logged for a living, I stayed in camp for two winters. They're kind of small and you can kind of get claustrophobic, but <laughs> they're all right though. <laughs> trailers, <clears throat> trailers. You can buy pop-ups. You can buy um, real little ones. You can pull behind the the small cars, or you can buy the real big 30-footers. And that's all in in the how much money you got, how much money you want to spend, and. I think you can rent trailers. I don't know if you can or not, and I don't know where to refer you to if you can. But you know, if, if you think you want to go that route, um, go to some of these places where they sell trailers and ask them if they got a rental that you can go out and try for a couple of times. About a half a mile on 14, off 421. There's a man there that rents campers. Is there? Okay. <clears throat> They look like they're all real nice, kept up real nice. Nice trailers and stuff? Yeah, they look really road safe. Okay. Are they, are they pop-ups or are they all types? I think there's three or four different types. Yeah. Because you see them um, in the springtime, you, you'll see quite a few of them there. Mm -hmm. And then other times when it's 
camping scenes are you hardly ever seen. You'll see one coming in or you'll see one leaving, but he does rent quite a few of them. This is a great way to see if you like it. Don't don't invest all your money until you see if you like. I've seen a lot of trailers around that people went out and camped once and they don't really like doing it. You know, it's, it's not for everybody. You know, it's the gentleman over here that has the campground. He rents trailers at his campground also. Oh, do you? They're stationary. Yeah. They're stationary. Yeah. Motor homes, again, this, this, is, uh, this is for people that's got lots of money or, or if you can find a used one. And there's all different price ranges. You can get the real big ones or you can get smaller ones. And, um, and those are nice. And they're, they're kind of like campers, though. You know, you get everything pulled out and you might have forgot that quart of milk and you got to pack everything up to go get it. But a lot of, lot of times these guys with motor homes, they pull cars behind them so they have a, a vehicle to go touring around in. You know. Now those two can be rented and you can rent those for a week or two weeks. And probably the biggest advantage to motor homes is when you're trying to camp with real small children. With has babies all and diapers and one and two year old toddlers. You have all your convenience inside. Yeah, you, you, you got can, your bathrooms in there. You got a sink and stove, and you got nice sleeping areas and tables. And you can get you can get in and out of the mosquitoes and stuff. Now, there's a lot of advantage to to a trailer. It's a good way to get started. Vans, they, they're conversion vans. Um, that's that's they got um, everything in there you need. Houseboats. This is, this is something I haven't did. I, I like to try it sometime, but um, down Kentucky Lake in, in Kentucky, they, they rent out houseboats. And um, you just, you rent a houseboat and you just go into little coves every night and you, you go swimming or do whatever you want to do. And I, I think you can do this on the Mississippi and there's several lakes around that you can do that. I, I think, <coughs> I don't know if Salamone or Missinwall has houseboats you can rent or not. But um, Potoka this does. Potoka, okay, that's right, Potoka does. Several places are, are starting to rent these houseboats around. I think it'd be a really neat adventure. You'll see them parked out in the middle of the lake, people's out swimming or fishing off of them. It's, it'd be a real good family time. I could see it'd be a lot of fun. Cabins, cabins is great. Cabins, you can rent them. <clears throat> At most of the state parks, they're a lot of fun. You, um, you can get some really good deals on off-seasons, off-season rates on the cabins. Um, I know we, as our family, we've had some really good times in cabins. We've, um, when we lived out in Washington, we used to have a, we was associated with a retired couple, and they had a cabin. And in the cabin, they just, it's all, um, no electricity. It's old kerosene lanterns, a wood stove, and and um, a big loft. And and we we used to just have a blast. We used to go up there on the weekends and bar bar it, and we we, we really had a good time. Just it's just a fun family time. <clears throat> um, has anybody got anything else to add about different housing? Something that's really fun that that. So, since, since you're all campers, um, available in England, if you've ever wanted to go to England, canal boats. Mm. You can go to England, you have to write, and I can get you the address if you really want it because there's a, some couples here in town that did it just a couple years ago. You can go to England, rent a canal boat, which is a complete camping outfit in a boat, and they give you a map of the canals of England and you can just go all over England. <laughs> in a canal boat, great. and uh, let the dike up, and let the you know, and float from town to town, and, and go up and down the rivers and the canals of England. And you can spend the whole summer doing that if you want. And they have places for you to go, and you just rent it, and you're supposed to leave it there when you leave, and then you come home. But that's a great vacation, a camping vacation in England. Then yeah, earlier I told you about our trip on the ferry, going up the inland passageway. It's from Seattle and goes all the way up to um, Kodiak, I think. 
It's just it's a ferry you board on there at Seattle, Washington, and um, they've got cabins in there, or you can sleep on the deck or, or whatever. And and this is really great. You just you can get off. There's you can get off St. Petersburg, Sitka, or Rawlings, or or wherever you want to get off. It stops at all these little ports all the way up. And you can get off and stay a day or two, and then you get back on and go on up. There's a lot of campgrounds in these little towns, and it's really great. It's, and it's a real relaxed, and I'm sure it's just like some of the cruises, I guess, on Caribbean cruises, but this is a little bit different. If you have enough money, you can put your car on the ferry, too, and take it with you. Yeah, yeah you can drive around. But, you, but when you go up on the Inland Passage, some of these little towns, are. They're road bounds. Some of these towns only have five, ten miles of road, and so you know, a car is nice, but but it's really not needed that much because you can walk to a lot of the areas you want to go. Juno's only got about ten miles of road. Yeah, yeah, but, fifteen miles. That's it. Yeah, yeah it's, it, it, they're so road bound. They, there's not that much road in there, so so they your don't car is not car thefts because <laughs> 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 they always catch them. <laughs> You mentioned vans. Uh, one of the really simple ways, if it's just a couple, Ford, Chevy, uh, Dodge, Plymouth, you just, all the back seats come out, and you just take a couple of uh, sleeping bags. foam rubber mattresses or sleeping bags, and you can even get some privacy things for your windows, very inexpensively, or one screen yeah. for one of the windows so that you can make sure you don't get a lot of mosquitoes, and you've got a very inexpensive camping plus your Get around. Yeah, you're right. I mean, Pickups with toppers on, that's that's a great way. Yeah, we did that. Okay. Sure. <laughs> um, just one more thing on the tents that I was thinking of um, when, we, when I was sitting over there is uh, when I first started getting associated with Clay's family, I always thought it was really neat because their family had the same type of tent that our family had, the big old blue tent. And we always thought that was really neat, you know, that we all had the same tents and that's what we grew up with. Um, right now we're going to talk about cooking and so different sources of heat that you could take to cook on. Um, one thing you could use is a charcoal stove, and everybody's used some kind of charcoal before probably. Um, you could use anything from a big charcoal grill to um, they make little bitty ones that uh, fold all up and they're real small that you can take with you. Um, another type of uh, cooking source that you could use is a gas grill. Um, this might be a little bit more convenient for you. It's probably easier to uh, get lit. Um, in certain situations it would be a lot easier, um, a lot quicker heat. Um, you don't have to mess with any kind of fuel. Um, with uh, the storage or pouring of the fuel. Um, there's also canned heat stoves. And um, those are not very practical for um, much cooking. Um, it's just a little can and it has a, some stuff in it that burns. And it, um, it's good to, for if you're backpacking, maybe you could use it. Um, it's a little expensive to buy the cans, but it's uh, to boil like one pot of, little pot of water or something. Um, you're not going to cook a whole lot on this kind of a stove. Um, there's gasoline stoves. Um, there's LP stoves. There's kerosene stoves like this one here. This is uh, white gas that you use in this. You have to pump it up. One thing about this is if you're going to use this, you're going to be storing and carrying fuel with you. And you might want to think about that. Um, you might be using a backpack stove like this, and it takes a little cylinder that fits on it. It's not much of a stove. It's really small. But you could heat up stuff on that. Um, a different type of backpack stove. This one takes um, white gas. It comes in this little bag. doesn't come out of the bag, but it comes <laughs> in the bag. And it has little legs on it. Flip those little legs out. And that's good for boiling pots for one or two people. You can't do a whole lot of cooking, you know, at one time on a stove like that. Uh, one thing about that is you are still carrying gas with you. 
Um, a lot of people don't like that feature. They don't like to have the, the mess or the danger. Um, if you go to LP, then you, have, you eliminate that and you'll have a cylinder, like on this lantern, to put on. And a lot of people like to do that. Um, it's easy to, uh, if you don't have any storage of the gas, you, you have your cylinder. When you're done with it, you throw it away. You have no can that you have to worry with or anything. It's a lot um, easier to light and get started. Right. This will light really quick. Um, if you use something like this, sometimes it's a little bit harder to light. Uh, if you're using something like this, if most of you have ever used a stove like this, you have to pump it up. And a lot of times it's a little bit more difficult to get the burners to light and to um, keep them the right uh, flow that you want to try to keep it hot enough to cook with. Um, let's see. Electrical appliances, if you're at some place where you can use electricity, a lot of people like to go that way. Um, now, that's not going to be practical if you're backpacking. There's not very many um, places that you can find a current bush to use for <laughs> backpacking. But um, one of my favorite ways of cooking still is campfire. And when you've got the campfire, you don't have to worry about all these other things. You don't have to worry about your fuel. You do have to worry about how to get it started if it's wet or something like that. But I like to uh, cook in the campfire. Probably one of my favorite things to use. Uh, one thing, um, <coughs> the next thing I put on here was lighting. And one reason I stuck both of these together was that it's sometimes real helpful to use the same kind of fuel for your stove as you're going to use for your land. So you're only dealing with one thing. So if you're going to use LP for your stove, you might as well get a lantern that uses the same thing. So you're only using one type of fuel. Coleman has a, has a marvelous device. Uh, if you buy a big cylinder tank, it comes with a tree that comes off of that with a lantern at the top and then side ports that go to your various other appliances. So you can have only one gas source and you can use it to light or fuel several different appliances. Right. And you can go from the big tank to the little tank, whichever you know you're red, um, wanting to use. If you're backpacking, you're going to want to carry something really small and lightweight. Um, a lot of the LP stoves are just like this stove right here, only they have an LP hookup on them. Which you can run off that cylinder like Right. Like there. Um, you always need to remember to take a flashlight. One thing about flashlights, though, is you always have dead batteries. <laughs> and so you have to worry about making sure you have plenty of batteries. Um, they do have a lot of neat things in flashlights, um, rechargeable flashlights now. Um, sometimes you can plug them in if you have an electrical hookup. But they also have um, rechargers that are uh, solar powered, too. So that might be something, if you're backpacking or something, you might want to look into instead of carrying um, the old batteries that once they're dead, they're dead. And the rechargers, that in, that's in the cars, too. They've got, it's like, the, it's like that one some of the police have. They're, you can um, slide them into a socket and then it charges off the car battery. Those are really nice. And this is just another kind of lantern. It takes two great big batteries in the bottom, and then you're packing batteries again if you're using a lantern, something like this. But this one, when it is on, it does put out a lot of light. Um, you can put it in a tent, and you can read for a long time. It's, it puts out quite a bit of light. The candle's real a neat light, too. They've got they got little enclosures that you can put your candles in, and, and there, a lot of people are going to that nowadays. And that's an, it's, it's dangerous in tents and stuff, but it's, it's still kind of a neat, romantic way of camping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I might add on the Coleman, well, it's not a Coleman stove, but that's a Sears, but it's Coleman, made by the Coleman Company. Years ago, we used to have a tree burner, and that, we could always tell what kind of a dinner we was going to have and how many burners she left, you know. She was going to have two burner or three burner or, or just a one burner. So we could always tell the size of the meal and how many burners a cook one left. So. <laughs> always kind of enjoyed about cooking as we can. It's, it's, it's been a challenge because, you know, you've got to be limited when you can be. You can't, you don't have your kitchen there. 
And it's just fun to see what you can create of what you have. As no boys, it's much fun at home, but when you're out camping with the kids and all, it is, it's fun just to be creative with what you can take and, and what you're limited with. Um, cook kits. This we've had, I, I don't know if it, we've had it the first time. I, I think we probably did. We've been carrying this old baby a long time. And uh, Jim really cleaned it up here before we went to Florida. It didn't look this good. And, I don't know how you got it looking so good. Well, it's magic. Magic. <laughs> I'm glad you did it. And I always have trouble getting this off, but it has to be tight or it won't work the way it's supposed to. This becomes the skillet. I guess probably, how many of you have got an outfit like this, you campers? Yeah, so most of you know what it is anyway, but the, that, that's the handle goes in there. So there's your skillet. And I um, I really like the little two burner uh, and I think we've um, kind of creatures of habit. They didn't used to have those little cylinders and so we've always taken the gas along but um, I think the two burner stove is is a neat way when you've got several to cook for it. So, it's easy to have. It's a lot easier if you've got two burners to cook with. If you're not cooking over the campfire, which is a lot of fun too. Um, here's the coffee pot, and all the cups are inside. But we always did take other cups along because these really, when you've got a hot cup of coffee in here, these tin, the tin gets really hot, and so we usually took some other cups along. So here's your coffee pot. And then nestle down in here. Two more pans. And another scallop with a handle. And then there are six plates down here. So we've got just about everything we need in this one big kettle. And if you want to, and Sharon, you, when she camps, they she doesn't take a dish pan along even. She just does her dishes in the big in the big kettle, don't you? I told her I have to have a dish pan when I go, but we don't all do it alike, and that's what we want to stress is that every family's going to camp a little bit differently. But some type of a nesting apparatus like this is really great and really handy and it doesn't take up a lot of space. That's a good coffee pot. Thank you. Well, you put that away, Mom. I'm going to show you, show them what I take my backpack, okay. my cooking equipment. I don't have a big tent like that. I do have two billy cans I can nest right down inside. And a fry pan with lid. And I got lids up fit all my little cans here. And two plates. And then in that little backpack stove Sharon showed you. And we can do just about everything mom can do, but it's a lot smaller quantities. We can um, bake in these. What we've made um, cakes and um, cinnamon rolls and and just all kinds of stuff just over that one little burner backpack stove down there. What you do, you just put three little pebbles in here and. Um, <coughs> Uh, I, yeah, I missed m my pie pan. I got a pie pan too. That she took my pie pan. I guess it looked kind of raunchy to toss these plates in here. <laughs> my pie pan fits right down in here. I put three little pebbles in there, and then put the lid on it. And then um, in the pie pan, you can put a cake or, or um, biscuits or whatever you want to, and put the lid on it and just cook it. And it'll, it acts just like an oven, and it works real fine. You can do the same thing with, with these billy cans. You can uh, 
put water down here into your can and, and then put the other one on top of it and you can bake a loaf of bread in there. You got, so you got enough stuff here to make a three course meal here with your fry pan and your two billy cans. Then if you really want a challenge, try <laughs> cooking in a paper sack. That's right. It can be done. You can fry eggs, you can fry bacon in a paper sack. But don't try to put it in a plane. If you want a real challenge, try that sometime. Okay, so we've got cooked kits. Then you can take griddles along if you're if you don't want to use your skillet, I've always used the skillet, but if you like to do a lot of pancakes, there's all kinds of griddles. I don't have any with me to show you a, a sample. You're going to need tongs, especially if you're going to be cooking in the campfire. You, you pretty much need something that you can grab that stuff. There's, there's one on top of the lid of that fry pan over there. This one? Yeah. And then there's, there's other kinds too, I guess, with longer handles. Something like that so that you can get your food in and out of the campfire. Um, water buckets. <coughs> we've had through the years we've had all manner of water buckets. We used to carry the kinds, the jug types with uh, lids on them. And most most of the time, if you're in a not too primitive a campground, you will have water, <coughs> but you're going to have to go get it somewhere and carry it to your campsite. It, <coughs> you're not going to have a faucet at your campsite, in other words. But gosh, the more we camp, the simpler we get. And so now, instead of taking a great big old heavy jug that, because I have to carry the water now, the kids aren't along, unless we have the grandkids, and they, they do carry it. But I just type two little buckets along, one for each hand. <laughs> carry my water that way. And as I said, I still have to have a dish pan when I do my dishes, if, at least when I'm, you know, that I know that I'm going to have room and I'm not going to be out backpacking. So it's what you feel, what you're going to feel comfortable with is what you need to take along to, to cook your meals. And then there's all kinds, all manner of bo check boxes to put the food in. And I. I used to take more. I don't take as much as I used to. I think I would rather just take enough food for a day or two, and then as I run out, if, we're, if I know that we're going to be close to shopping where I can go get more food, just you know, get more food as I need it. Take a few of the basics along that you know you're going to. If you think you're going to be wanting to do some baking, then take along your flour and sugar, or maybe Bisquick, what, <coughs> some things like that that you think you have to plan a little bit ahead so that you know what, think about what you're going to be cooking and, and take what you think you're going to be needing in that respect. Um, ice chests, there again, all kinds. This is the kind that, the type we've used. On your first day out, you can freeze your own ice, put it in a milk jug and, or a, a carton <coughs> and have your ice all ready when you leave to take along your milk and juice and meat and things like that to keep cool. You can take bigger ones or smaller ones, or maybe you're not going to take any perishable that ice chests or something that you may or may not want to take. Hand protection, you should have some uh, mitts or some hot pads or gloves <coughs> or something that to take care of your hot pans. If you're going to do some baking, you need some measuring devices, uh, dishwashing tools, again, well, however you want to do it. <coughs> the Girl Scouts have <coughs> baking bags that they, the way they do it. So. However simple or complicated you want to get with your dish pans and dish soap and towels and, and cloths for washing, mixing tools, and then your dining area. Um, a lot
lot of times we've taken along an extra, besides our tent, we take along an, an extra <coughs> fly or tarp to set up to put over our picnic table and our stove and to keep it when we're eating and it comes up rain and we're, we're protected from the elements or from the sunshine or even helps keep the wind off. So there again, that's just up to your decision how how much you want to go or how much room you have to take along those types of things. Um, when you set up camp, you want to think about where the tent's going to sit and, and if there's a picnic table. There, sometimes you won't have a picnic table. You might want to think about taking along um, a collapsible table or a folding table or maybe you'll just want to spread out a cloth on the ground. You might want to think about taking a vinyl table cover. Um, something else while we're talking about dining area. You people that can't know this, but um, you need to put that food up at night or if you're going to leave, leave the area. The, um, put it inside the car. The animals like to get in your food. And, um, I know that the, the raccoons, I, we've had some experiences with raccoons getting in the cooler. And I remember one year, I didn't put it all up. And I remember a lot of <coughs> hearing the raccoon <laughs> chewing up the cooler. And the next morning, we didn't have any food left. And so, and of course, there's some places where there are other animals, too, just besides the little, the little critters. So it's important to keep your food put away when you're not at the campsite. Um, storage of food and gear in the chuck box. Well, that's, um, I've kind of covered that. Um, take along the basic things you need and, and then as you travel, stop and get the rest. And I like to take easy things and then get creative. Take along some onions and potatoes and some bisquick and some of those things that make easy meals and that you can do a lot of different things with. Fire building materials. Um, if you're going to be cooking over the campfire, uh, you'll probably need to take your axe and maybe a little saw and take the kids along to gather up the tinder and the wood and matches, lighter, something to get the fire started with. Can you think of anything else, Sharon, on that, on that, on the cooking? I don't think we could down there. You're going to have, we got our cook in here, but you're going to have to have some utensils to eat with, too, and some glasses. Whatever it takes to get a meal, you're going to have to have that, you're going to have to take that along. Is that it for this one? Anybody have any questions or any of you gals that have camped? What do, what do you do? When we were tent camping, we had, uh, Someone gave us an old cooler that didn't have, didn't fit real snug, mm -hmm. so you couldn't use it as a, as an ice cooler. And we bought a new one for to put our cold stuff in. And I put our things like bread and our bisquick, maybe the potatoes if I had room, stuff like that in there. Mm -hmm. And it kept a lot of like ants and things like that. Out of That's a good idea. That, yeah. We also, when uh, we go camping with Boy Scouts. Um, we have the cook kits and everything, but we wouldn't use the skillets. We'd always bring along iron skillets because they oh, cook a like lot better. Mm -hmm. And they're heavier, but they also cook a lot better than mm -hmm. the, they're easier to clean than mm -hmm. aluminum skillets. If you use uh, cleaning your lint traps, if you use a lint, it makes a good fire spring. Oh, yeah. That would be I guess cooking over fire, if you soak the bottom and yeah. ground the sides of your pan, mm -hmm. it takes the black off the pan. When you go to wash it, it takes the black off your pan real, real easy. Mm -hmm. Just take a uh, dish, dish portion of soap and just soak the edges and the bottom of your pan. It makes the pan clean up a lot easier. It's so like if you have matches, you put them in a, like a uh, metal uh, 
Band-Aid Band box. Mm -hmm. That way they'll stay dry. They won't take dry any moisture. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody always talks about soaping their pans. And I think we in this series we've had 25 people telling us about soaping oh. pans. I always hated soaping pans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have soap in one batch of stew. And you never again will soak it again. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one little boy scout that, that filled the damn salt shaker full of that damn white soap. And then you poisoned the whole unit. Um, <laughs> soap can be a dangerous thing on a camping trip. You get the Tetrox trots and they last for a week. And, uh, so I mean there's pros and cons. But a couple extra SOS pads takes the black right, right off too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Soapy Brillo pads afterwards are better. Either. Yeah. <laughs> Good, Good suggestion. Anything else in those lines? I think it's just really up to the cook. How, you know, I think you're going to think about that a lot. Um, don't forget the can opener. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right along here. We've got a few more things to talk about and we're running out of time, so I'm going to go pretty quick. Um, when you're uh, camping, you need to take only the clothes that you absolutely need. There's no reason to take everything in your wardrobe. And when you're camping, you're usually not going to take your Sunday best and wear it out camping and sit around the campfire in it. So what I tell my family is every one of them gets one little gym bag and that's it has to fit in the car with all their sleeping bags and everything else, so that's all they get. So we usually have two or three days worth of clothes and then we change and um, that works out real good for our family. We go to the laundromat, wash them up, and so we don't have to pack so many extra things. Um, you need to pack each person separately too and that makes it a lot easier when you decide that you need your underwear, you don't want to have to leave for everybody else's to find your pair. So it makes it, it, makes it a lot easier if you pack everybody totally separate. But always have your rain gear at the top, somewhere where you can get it, because when it's raining and you get wet, it's no fun. So you always need your rain gear out. Also, when you're camping, always remember that um, if you're going to do a lot of walking or anything like that, you need to dress for that. You need to be prepared. Don't buy a brand new pair of hiking boots and go that day um, out and try to hike five miles in a brand new pair of hiking boots. You want clothes that have, you know, are fitting. Um, comfortable. A lot of times dress in layers. That helps a lot. Um, if we go backpacking in the summer, I'll wear shorts and then at night I'll just pull on overalls or something, you know, bibs or something, hope over the shorts and then um, I have layers on that keeps me warm. Um, always remember your hat. Even in the summer you might need a hat. I hate hats, so <laughs> I'm not a very good one to wear a hat. But in the summer it'll protect you from the sun and in the winter it's going to keep you warm. Um, and uh, gloves are a good thing to remember too. Change your Even clothes at night before you go to bed. Huh? Change your clothes at night. Right. Make sure you always change your clothes before you go to bed at night. Okay. I guess you've all sleep a sleeping bag. Here's one sample of, of one kind of sleeping bag, but there's all kinds. This is a pretty nice weight right here. I don't know what weight it is, but <laughs> it's a Coleman bag. It washes real easy. You throw it in the washing machine and throw it in the dryer. And um, it keeps it, it kept us warm at uh, 34 degrees last week. There are mummy bags that are closer fitting, and I think they're really warm, aren't they? I yeah, I've see. got a mummy bag on my pack there. Okay, if anybody wants to look at it later on, they can, but I think they're for really, really cold weather, and they're real tight fitting, and I'd like, I always wanted to try one. I think they might be okay. <laughs> um, I think somebody hit on air mattresses a little bit before, or some kind of pads. There's, um, our kids used to not always cry because they always said their air mattress got the hole in it and it went down. And so we gave up air mattresses. We've had cots. 
um, we've had pads. A pad that we've really liked is um, a thicker foam with kind of a waffle bottom, and it was really comfortable. I wish we had those back because that was the best thing we ever had. There is a pad that's available if you have some friends at the hospital. It's called a geomat. And what they do is they take the foam and put it on end, and it's sewn on end, and then it rolls up. It is the most comfortable thing in the world. The problem is they cost about a hundred bucks, yeah. and the way you get them is when they throw them out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, most people know they stand there in line for them, so uh, they're very cheap if you get them that way. <laughs> I have one. <laughs> well, the one ones we have now are not, they're really thin, and uh, they're not good for old folks, I'll tell you that. So, that's, there again, you're going to see that you're, you're, what you're sleeping under is kind of a personal preference. And then pillows if you need them, talk about cots. I don't know what kind of beds we're thinking about here. And campers. Um, and campers, okay. Um, and then insect protection, Clay mentioned what about the sheet over the head if you're sleeping under the stars, but you still, uh, really we've never had trouble with insects getting inside the tent except the little no seams. Uh, but you're pretty safe as long as you're inside the tent and you keep your tent closed so that the bugs aren't coming in. But when you're outside, you're, most of the time, if you can stand the off or whatever you use to keep the mosquitoes off, why you'll, you're going to need it. And your sleep clothing, um, that's just, I think, a matter of what kind of temperature you're going to be sleeping in as to what you wear, but it is important that you change clothes. I know a lot of times when you're taking kids out camping, they think they're not going to change clothes, but it's very important, in no matter what temperature, that you get these, these clothes off and get into something fresh and dry so that you're staying warm or cool or whatever. Uh, sweats are a good thing. Uh, a clean pair of sweats to put on uh, is a pretty good thing to sleep in. If it's cold weather, <clears throat> it's really true. If you keep your head warm, that's going to keep you warm all over. So we had our stocking caps on last week when we were sleeping, and we had socks on our feet and, and sweats on. So, okay. talk about camp toilets and grooming. Um, one thing you need to check on when you go someplace, if you're backpacking or whatever, you need to check, are there restrooms and water available for you? If there's not, there's other things that you're going to have to do. Um, are there showers? If not, you're going to have to do something else to get clean. Do you need to dig a toilet? Okay, if there's no restroom, you need to take a shovel with you so you can dig a toilet. That may not be a lot of fun for a lot of you, but you're going to have to do something, okay? If there's no showers, what are you going to do? You're going to take a bath in a pan or in the river, or you can try to keep the soap out of the river, but you still could get water from the river, uh, from a stream. Um, you know, uh, you need to figure out some way to get your bath if you need one. Um, and toilet paper. And I go everywhere, I take toilet paper. I have toilet paper in the trunk of my car because I do not go anywhere without making sure somebody, there's toilet paper. And it's always good to put your toilet paper in something that keeps it dry. Now, if you're backpacking, you might want to stick it in a Ziploc bag. But if you're camping, you might want to take it like this. And when you go out to use the restroom, you've got your dry toilet paper with you. Um, even if you go to state parks, national forests, wherever, there's not always toilet paper available. So. I always bring my toilet paper. Okay, camp tools. Uh, axe or a hatchet? I got several different ones. Um, this, axe, this axe right here has a hammer on it. Um, basically what you need an axe for is just uh, if you were wanting to chop up wood for fire or um, the axe with the hammer on it, you can pound in uh, steaks, just do about whatever you want. Um, okay. And then there's saws you can cut your firewood up with. Um, there's some that
claps down really small that are only about that wide and about as long as this one. And uh, you just have to pull them out and use that. Um, then you got your knife. All you need is basically a pocket knife. And you can cut rope with it. You can, uh, for, you can even cook with it. You can cut your hot dogs or whatever you want to do. And, um, then a shovel. You can use a shovel to, uh, to dig your toilet or um, to dig a hole and put dishwash water in. Um, you got some collapsible ones. You just gotta screw that out and flip it up and it makes a nice shovel. When Isaac was talking about a knife, a pocket knife all you need. You don't need a knife that will hang clear down to your knees. Those things are they're just dangerous. I, I have people come out camping. Boy, every time I see a guy come out with a knife that long, I just, I'm just scared. I know there's an accident ready to happen. <laughs> so a pocket knife is all you need. First aid kits and safety. Water activities, life jackets. Okay, this is very important for if you go canoeing. Um, rafting or, or boating, any type of boating or anything, make sure you have life jackets and use them. They're, they're not to sit on, they're, they're to be used. And it's real important to, to wear that. Um, what do you do if you get lost? Um, you, there's several things you, you need to do. First thing, sit down and be calm. <coughs> That's worse. People usually get hysteric and go crazy and, and start walking. And usually what happens when you start walking, you just start walking a circle and you just keep walking a big circle and, and you get or you'll get lost worse. So the best thing is just sit down and take it easy and gather your soft thoughts. And it's really if if you don't know which way to go, stay put and build a fire. If you it's good to carry a whistle, you can blow a whistle. Any, any combination of three, you know, three fires, three whistle blows, if you're hunting and you're lost, three gunshots. A signal of three means that you need, there's, you need um, help. It's a distress signal. So basically relax and, and make some type of smoke or device so people can see where you're at. If you think you're going to be there for a while, start planning, planning an attack, planning your shelter. Start making some shelter, look around, maybe you can find some things to eat or something. Okay, what do you do in a lightning storm? Okay, first thing is don't go up on top of a ridge. Get, up, get away from, get in the lowest point. Don't, don't stay high. Don't go underneath a tree. Trees are great conductors. They'll strike at the top and they'll go all the way down to the roots and if you're sitting on underneath that root, you'll get, you'll get struck too. So uh, get away from trees. Um, if you're around your automobile, your automobile is your best place because you've got four tires that's acting as rubber insulators. That's your best place or a low lying area is your best place for lightning or storms, tornadoes or anything. What do you do about wild animals? There's, um, we've talked about coons a lot, and I'm sure everybody that's went camping has got a coon story, don't you? <laughs> about getting in your, in, watching, getting in your food somehow. If you go out west or down in the Smoky Mountains, um, you have bear, so you gotta have, um, if you don't, if you're out backpacking, you gotta hang a bear bag. You pick two trees and you, and, and swing the rope over the top, two trees real high and, and get your uh, food bag and you hoist it up. And um, when I say food, you're also talking about your tooth, toothpaste, your soap, anything that's got a scent you need to put in that food bag or you need to put away in your car. You need to get that away because animals, um, raccoons, bears, um, possums, skunks, Mice, anything that smells, they're going to come after it. So you need to, you need to get that someplace where they're not going to get it. 
I've got a real short story I want to tell about wild animals, um, about skunks. One night, um, me and my brother was down in Smokies backpacking, and we just got off the trail that night. It was real rainy and wet, and we um, was sleeping. We got into the main campgrounds, and we um, there was a picnic shelter, so it, it was dark, and we seen that shelter, and we thought that was a great place to spend the night. So we threw our sleeping bags and and, and started sacking out. It was probably about 8 o'clock, and we was snoring away pretty good, and about 1 o'clock that morning, we felt little footprints just walking over the top of us, all over us. And then we caught that real nice aroma. <laughs> and we, and that, when you smelled it, that's when your eyes really popped up. You know, you really, really was awake right then. But then you, you, you had to think real quick. We thought real quick, you don't want to make a lot of moves. And we whispered back and forth, and we finally figured out those were skunks. They were skunks just walking all the top of us. We laid there for about a couple hours, and those skunks were just smelling us out and looking to see if we had any candy or anything in our gear. And lucky enough, we, we had everything packed away in the right place, and they didn't bother us, and they finally went on. So things like that will happen. If you prepare and think ahead, you, you'll be all right. Um, what about poison animals and plants? Poison animals, we've got some poisonous snakes in the area. We've got a few rattlesnakes. You go a little bit farther south, you'll get some copperheads. And you go farther south, you'll get in some coral snakes in Florida in that area. Um, snakes won't bother you if you don't bother them. If you're in a heavy snake area, you need to wash before you walk over a, a log. Look on the other side of the log before you step over it. Or, or um, if you're walking down the trail, kind of watch the trail, if there's, especially if there's a lot of sun shining on the trail where they're out sun themselves, they'll, they'll go out in the trail to sun themselves and absorb, absorb the heat. Um, all, like we, um, other animals, um, bears, if you go out west um, in the grizzly area, you just need to make sure they, they got a, a tin can, what they, they what do they call that, Dad, where they put the pebbles in the tin can? You just kind of walk along and, and shake that. It kind of scares the bear. They, they got a name for that can. I forget what they call it. And they also have bells that you can put on your tie on your, your shoelaces and so that, that you're making a noise. That, yeah. That's as, as the thing with most wild animals. You startle them as much as they start, startle you, and, and they're just acting in defense. And, and so the best thing, if you can make noise, they'll, they'll know you're coming. You won't start them, and, and everybody will be all right. Um, poisonous plants, we've got some poison ivy, poison oak, and poison sumac. Um, for poison ivy and poison oak, leaves of three. You want to kind of stay away from them, okay? Because those are usually poison ivory or poison oak. And poison sumac. Um, and be careful when you're burning some stuff. When you're burning, don't go out and gather a bunch of poison ivy to toss in your fire because everybody's going to be sitting around that fire is going to have poison ivy. I guarantee you that. That, burnt, that oil will get you know, off. I still see a lot of that in the wintertime. For people who simply get logs, and the vines are on the logs, yeah. and people who are terribly allergic to ivy, just the smoke of that, and, and they break out. Yeah. So if you're burning up tree stumps that got a lot of vines on them, good luck. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's about all I got on first aid. Oh, first aid kits. The best first aid kits is a store bark first aid kits, and then add to them. What I, and, and make sure it's in a good container, a good dry container. You know, if you have a good one in your car, a nice big one in the car, if you're backpacking and can't carry a big one, get a smaller one. You always need to take a first aid kit. Anything else? Yeah, after you've got poison ivy, what's good to put on? We'll let Doc answer that. The first, first aid for ivy, if you get out and get into a vine as you wash, 
It works with the best soap you have. They used to say Fel Fels Napa, but any kind of good soap, wash it off. Uh, short of that, uh, you're in trouble. Uh, the best thing you can commercially buy is ventilated calamite. And if you get bad enough, I believe it's a medical emergency. I think you need to get on some steroids and get, get it treated. If, when you wash it off, sometimes soap don't really cut that well. That's what that is, an oil in there. And I use alcohol. I, I get poison ivy, and if I'm in it all day long, I'll get rubbing alcohol, and I'll wash down with rubbing alcohol. And that's prevented a lot of times for me. Get it off your skin. Yeah, cut that, get something to cut that oil off there, and then it'll work well. Any questions? We're getting down close to the end here. Where can you get equipment and information? Well, if you're a first-time camper, the best way to get in or get equipment is try to borrow it somewhere. Uh, if you have a friend that's camped or something like that, well, try borrowing some equipment off of them instead of going out and laying out a big outlay of money on for a tent and cook gear on the stove and all that. To try to borrow some. Uh, where you can buy equipment, uh, Walmart, Kmart, uh, sporting goods stores, uh, uh, there's all kind of catalog, uh, sports catalog, <coughs> warehouses you can buy from. One that comes to my mind is Gander Mountain, that's a good uh, source of camping equipment, uh, tents and so forth. So, uh, Information on camping, you can get it from the uh, DNR, the Department of Natural Resources, that of any state. Uh, if you're going out of state, they, all states, I think, has a Department of Natural Resources. It may not be called that, but similar to that. Uh, in your camp book, if you buy a camp uh, directory, a lot of that is listed in that. Uh, contact those people, they'll tell you about campgrounds and uh, what to see around there. Also, uh, you can get uh, information at uh, some of the state parks for other state parks. If you, if you go down up here to uh, Tippecanoe, well, they'll know about the other state parks in Indiana. So you can get information that's easily found. Uh, also, from the, the Department of Interior, for if you're going to uh, do some uh, camping out in the uh, Back country or the uh, national forest somewhere, you contact the Department of Natural or Interior, and they can send you information. Chamber of Commerce is from different areas; they can tell you what what's available, what to see, different points of interest, and things like this. Uh, travel clubs, if you want uh, uh, traveling information, AAA, Chicago Motor Club. Uh, I think Standard Oil has them. So there's all kind of clubs like that that you can get information from. Then if you really want to get into it and really make an enjoyable trip, go to your library and study a little bit about where you're going and what you're going to see while you're there. And get a little knowledge. It takes time, but it, uh, it also is rewarding because you know what you're going to be looking for when you see it. Yeah, I, I read about that. They said it this. So it just makes the trip a lot more enjoyable. Is there any questions on that? Go ahead. Sure. Hey, we're gonna we're running over time here, so we're gonna finish it up here. Um, just remember that you need to take advantage of things that are offered in your area, um, such as Boy Scout troops, Girl Scout um, organizations, YMCA um, programs, um, church groups. And um, programs that are offered at the parks, like naturalist programs and things, when you're out um, using the state park, remember to go to those programs because they're really helpful. And I just have a closing thought for you here. Um, remember that in the beginning God created the earth, and he said in Genesis chapter 1, 28, that we were to have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So are we giving all these things to be taken care of, for us to take care of? And I think that it's very important that we remember when we're using the outdoors, the environment, we need to protect it so that we'll have it for the future for everyone else to use um, in uh, maybe our grandkids and their grandkids. Thanks. We had a good time. If you have any more questions, please. Thank you, Watson. It's
I have a few uh, hundred copies here of Indiana Fishing and Hunting Guides. For you, please take them along. Otherwise, I'll consider it littering. <laughs> thank you for coming to the series. We thank you for your contributions tonight. Good evening. <laughs>